Well, it was kind of ha happening not only in the AWA, it was ha happening in world class, it was happening in, in uh, where Bill Watts promoted. It was happening all over the country. And Vince McMahon, basically what he was doing was picking off talent that all the other promoters developed over the years and all their angles. And he would, he would go in and grab a, grab a Hulk Hogan from us. He would grab a, uh, uh, oh geez, who'd he grab from Bill Watts? And he'd grab a Ronnie Piper from Don Owens, and he'd grab somebody from Fritz von Erich, somebody from Florida. All their top people, and he'd try to grab them at a point where they were in angles, drawing money, yanking them away, and then coming into your area trying to get your TV show and look more like the AWA, World Class, or Memphis, or Mid-South than we were. Mm -hmm. And it was frustrating because the promoters at that time, you had Bob Geigel, Don Owens, Fritz von Erich, um, Bill Watts, Eddie Graham, Eddie Graham sure. the Crockett's. All those promoters have huge freaking egos. And to bring them all together was, was almost impossible to do, but my father, Vern, tried to do it. And um, we thought it could work. And that was the way to, to compete against McMahon, mm -hmm. by bringing all this talent together, trying to get a national show, and then going up against him. Is there a time before that, before you decide to make the, the, the concerted effort, um, that that you would just oppose him separately? I mean, and, and, and well, say, you tried. Yeah. I mean, you tried. I mean, here, uh, I worked for the McMahons for a while, and uh, sitting on the plane with Vince, and he said, you know, my intention was never to put anybody out of business. I said, well, Vince, if that's the case, then why did you come in and steal talent? when everybody, since wrestling began, had a handshake and, and that was their contract. And, you know, not that that was so bad, but then when you would come into TV stations that these promoters who got off their asses, flew to San Francisco, got together with a TV station, tough time getting wrestling on, yeah. get it on, have it on for three years and finally build the ratings up to where now you can go in and legitimately make money in San Francisco. McMahon come in and hand them $5,000 a week. Done. Done. All of a sudden, I tell you, good, good deal. We're, we're in this meeting in Chicago with all these promoters putting USA Wrestling together. Going to combine the whole thing. Or Pro Wrestling USA. Okay? And we get a phone call from the TV station in San Francisco. And we've got, we have just put out our, our tapes four weeks to San Francisco, sent them all out with all the interviews in, plugging the big match. It was Crusher and, uh, God, I think it was Mad Dog in a cage match out there. Mm -hmm. And we're going to sell out the Cow Palace. And we built this up for three years mm -hmm. to finally get to that stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get a phone call from this TV station. Vern, hey, Vince McMahon was out here. Now, we had bartered all our time on TV, so we gave them our show. We kept, at that time, six minutes, and the TV station had six to sell. Okay. Okay? So we were on for nothing. McMahon just offered me $2,000 to put his show on next week. And, I mean, we got this big card coming up, and Vern says, well, you know what, we have an agreement. He says, well, Vern, you know, I can't turn down the money. He said, okay, I'll, you know, we'll do 2500 Okay, you got a deal. So we go back in the meeting, get another phone call. Hey, Vince is up to three grand. You know, and he came back in and he's telling Watson, God damn, fucker, what do we, you know. He says, all right, we'll do 3500 And that's it. And the guy says, Vern, you got my word, that's it. So we call back to our, our guys, get all the tapes out there for them, they're going to play them. So now we're going on with the promotion, thinking we're on TV. Yeah. Vince had gone over our head, guaranteed him $5,000 a week. They pulled our show off TV without even telling us. Tell you All of a sudden song. sent the tapes back. Mm -hmm. I said, so Vince, if you weren't trying to put anybody out of business, why would you do that? 
he came into Minneapolis to Stu Schwartz, our TV station manager at that time. We'd been on with his father. We'd, I mean, in Minneapolis, we were locked in. Stu told us he came in with a briefcase, $250,000 in cash, laid it on the table. Take Ganyas off, put me on. He's the only one that turned it down. We know the first match. Right. And uh, we know uh, seventh and eighth match. Right. You, you want to put your main event last? Yeah. My main event is going to be... And it's going to be Steamboat Morocco? Morocco and the Orndorffel Wyndham. And again, uh, Wyndham uh, and uh, Orndorff right before that? Yeah, and again, we're going back, and Morocco's not the Intercontinental Champion. Okay, right, okay. that's true, okay. So he, we don't, we're not, he's not the Intercontinental Champion at this time. Okay. Okay? We'll have that happen when we do the uh, Intercontinental, guys. We'll just remember yeah. we have to have him drop it before yeah. April. Okay, okay, so the tag teams, you were saying the placement of the tag teams yeah. in the card. We've okay. got fabulous ones coming. We've got, uh, we have Saito here now, so you can put him yeah. with Fuji. What are you thinking? I would put the fabulous ones against the Freebirds. Where? On third. Again, you know, what a great team. Okay. And then. On fourth, I would have Blackjack Mulligan versus Ivan Koloff. Okay, you got you know you're gonna have a rugged match there. It's old school. You got a former world champion and a guy everybody knows who's I don't know how many times at, at that time have been tag team champions mm -hmm. for Monza, okay? And he had wrestled everybody for the title. Right. Okay, yeah. on a, a sixth math, and this is the gardens, we're gonna have Andre. And I put Andre against Big John Studd. Okay. After the fourth match, I would put a Piper's Pit. Yeah. Did you like that concept? Did you like how he, uh, how yes. he did the pit? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I did. Very much so. I mean, people still talk about the coconut. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I would have him... Look at this goddamn card, by the way. Jesus. To, to get Roddy over... Him being so quick, and if this was his first time, I'd put somebody out there that couldn't match which with Roddy. So Roddy could really get over. Any suggestions? I am Mike Shop. <laughs> okay. So now all I have to do is fill in that second match. And the second match, uh, we want to start out hot. I want to, then the free birds and the fabulous ones will have a hot finish. And we're going to break away from the standard thing they used to do of countouts, like when you put Koloff and Mulligan together. Okay, the, that was an easy way out. Nobody has to think of a finish. With these two guys, you get in the room and you say, I need Mulligan to get over. Tell me how to do it. And they'll come up with a great finish. You can give them suggestions. You can point them in the right direction. But nobody knows how to get these, this finish over like they're going to. Mm. More than likely, you know, he'll, he'll go for the claw. Right, right. The claw, get the claw stuck. I will go for something. And they'll have no referee bumps. Let's get rid of referee bumps. They're never going to see a referee bump. Okay. <laughs> until this title switch. Okay. There's never a referee bump. 
okay? Because they, they'll abuse it if they yeah, overuse yeah. those Everything, kind of, yeah. everything. And that's what ha happened, I believe, that when they went to big shows, when they had two stars, they thought, well, we can't have either one of them lose. Well, somebody has to lose and somebody has to win. They did it too often, wouldn't you say, in too New often. York? And, yeah. and the count outs and the, count the 20 instead of 10, you know, yeah. remember these? And it was formulaic, too. Yeah. You know you're getting the same thing. The yeah. first month they met, you're going to get a DQ. So then the next time they come in, you have an ODQ match, you get a count out. And then the third month, you get the blow off in the cage. Right. The garden became kind of formulaic yeah. with Backlund and, yeah. and Hogan that way. Now, where are you going to put? You going to put any juice on this card? Who's uh, who's going to leave the mat stained here? Um, now, this is our first show, right? Well, this is a, this is a show uh, somewhere in the in the midst of this angle. Okay. You, we've okay. already established Steamboat uh, a little bit. He's taken the title, okay. so we're in April. We're four months in. The guy that's going to get the juice is Barry Windham. Nobody bleeds better than Barry, and he's going to get owned off over by bleeding. So. That's the only juice on the card. How are you going to keep Kolov's head from opening up, even by accident? Crazy glue? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But on the second match, we want him. At this time, it's 1984, and he's 195 pounds and can fly the Tonga kit. Are you going to put him over? Yeah, and I'm going to put him over. Let me see. Who else we got here? I'm going to put him over. Uh, Kurt Henning. But Kurt's going to get heat after the match. Vince would go down, uh, he would have everything, and, and in those days, um, that production meeting was, was basically the compilation of everything that might have been a week or more as part of the working process of changes. And I would have a, a big ledger, Pat Patterson have a big ledger, we would sit towards the back of the room, and Vince would sit up front and basically conduct the meeting as if everything came from him, from him and him alone, <laughs> and every now and then he would he would either forget to erase something or change a note, and it would be incorrect. Uh, I'd look at Pat. Pat would look at me, and one of us would. Uh, Vince, I think you you told us that you decided that you wanted to do this instead. That's right, I did, and 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 I mean it was almost comical, but I don't and I don't know that any, any other people in the room picked up on it, but. Um, Kept Vince was happy. Vince was in charge, and mm -hmm. you know, and he, but he would basically tell everybody what was going to happen and be able to anticipate it. And it was a real shock to me in the beginning because uh, being brought up with kayfabe and basically telling all these people what was going to happen. Right, we're going to have a run in here, so make sure yeah. you've got a handheld over there so that when he yep. knocks him off the announce table, you can. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So for our purposes today, uh, booking. The uh, fictional pay-per-view card that we have, <clears throat> which we'll get to in a minute. Um, the shows we're going to use are uh, a, a typical wrestling month, one month. Um, it's a very condensed version. Uh, these angles would develop probably over what would be six months in advance. You were given some of this stuff, nine months. I go back to when I first joined the World Wrestling Federation. They they had at that point, I think. The Royal Rumble had already taken place, so that became the fifth major pay-per-view. And during my time there, I don't know if it was the second or third year, they they uh, did the in-your-house in pay-per-views, which became mm -hmm. monthly, monthly things basically. because, uh, you know, Vince has always been a visionary, and he realized that pay-per-view uh, was really just another arena with basically unlimited seating. And... Uh, so that's how he looked at it, as uh, as where the future was was pay per view. So how far in advance would you say it was? It Royal Rumbles when you came in? Yeah, and I came. I started in February. The month uh, 
that Royal Rumble had just taken place, and uh, the next major event was was WrestleMania, and I came in the year that they did Atlantic City. I think it was the only time that they ever went back to the same venue back to back, and I came in. Yes, the four second, and five. The second four, year, five, for, sort of for five. five for when they did the uh, did the second from. And at that point, they had already obviously developed what they were going to do for that WrestleMania, which at that point would have been two months away, and probably up through the summer. Right? Yes, and Vince would, um, it was very hard at times because the business is very demanding, and when you know that your TVs are going to be a Monday and a Tuesday, and you got to do three hours Monday and three hours Tuesday, you know that you're not going to be able to rest until you have it down on paper. Mm -hmm. And the hardest part is to have three blank sheets for for your one and three blank sheets for your, for your other show where you had two TVs in, in, in a major market, in most of your major markets, and to start with a blank piece of paper. Where are we going to go from mm -hmm. here? And Vince had a, um, I call it a habit, but I call it a habit. <laughs> of, a practice. A practice of... It, it would it would almost like he would go to lengths to not say okay let's start to write some things down he, and he would look at the big picture and even if you were past WrestleMania and you were talking about SummerSlam coming up Vince would be thinking not so much of SummerSlam and what you're going to do he would be looking to WrestleMania for the following year already and that was kind of the the, the, the peak of where you were, were trying to get to. Right. And he would always be looking for that Andre, uh, Hulk Hogan Andre first time meeting right. that, that was so successful in the Silver Dome. He was always looking for for matches. Uh, you didn't see a, a baby face match or heel matches all that often, but he would divert from his normal formula to make a match for WrestleMania, a, a, a dream match. A real standout, yeah. A real standout.